you are now in the design interface screen. The tabs along the top of the screen are organized chronologically with the design process in mind. The design criteria tab is automatically selected. The user can either select conventional analysis or reinforced analysis to see the relevant design criteria. Subtab 1 is design notes which provide brief commentary about the design methodology chosen. Subtab 2 is empirical checks. These are empirical minimum or maximum values for such elements as wall embedment depth, reinforcement length, base to height ratio, anchorage length, and geogrid separation. Subtab 3 is factors of safety. The user can select either static or seismic to show the various minimum factors of safety for a given mode of failure. Subtab 4 design inputs. This final category of design criteria includes some remaining design constants and variables that are applicable only to the Ashto methodology and therefore remain blank when running NCMA. For each subtab, the default value is as stated in the chosen design methodology. The user has the option of modifying the used value, keeping in mind that any changes that differ from the default will be at their own risk. Wall Unit Tab the wall unit tab allows the user to select an SRW block supplier from a list of industry leading block licensors or manufacturers that have participated in the VESPA program or they may select a user defined block. A user defined block is a block that has been input by the user in the block maintenance screen which will be demonstrated momentarily. In the wall unit screen the properties of the block cannot be modified. These properties have been supplied by the block licensor or manufacturer and are uneditable. For a user-defined block, the designer must first define the block in the wall unit's maintenance screen located in the settings menu list. I will now show you how to access the block maintenance screen before we go any further in the design process. By selecting settings, the drop-down menu provides a number of options to add or modify various different design settings which we will discuss in more detail later. For now, we will select Wall Units. From the Supplier drop-down menu, we can view all of the preloaded suppliers. When a particular supplier is selected, that supplier's SRW blocks are shown in the table below. By selecting any SRW block in the table, we can see all of the licensor or manufacturer provided design data related to that block. Note that the wall unit maintenance screen, we still cannot edit those block properties as they have been provided by the supplier and should not be modified. If the designer wanted to enter in a completely new block, they would then select User Defined as the supplier from the Supplier drop-down menu. We can now add a new block by selecting New. Note that the unit weight of the block is automatically calculated based on the SRW mass and dimensions. The SRW mass should include the infill material if applicable. Once we have entered in our new block, we select Save and this block is added to the user defined list. Note that we have not yet entered in the connection properties of this block in various different geogrids. This is done in the connection properties section of the settings menu which you will be shown shortly. To exit the wall unit's maintenance screen, select Close. We are still in the wall unit tab and now can select either a preloaded supplier and block or the user defined block we just input. For this example, we will use an example block supplier called Block Supplier A. Note that three different sample blocks show up in the table below. We will choose sample block A2. At the bottom of the wall unit tab, we have the option of inputting the size of the granular base for the wall. Simply input the base extent or distant the base extends out in front and behind the block and the base thickness. This is only used for quantity calculations and bearing capacity calculations for conventional walls. Now we will move to the next tab, Reinforcement. The Reinforcement tab works the same way as the Wall Unit tab but for the reinforcements. 
The Reinforcement tab allows the user to select a reinforcement supplier from a list of industry-leading geosynthetic reinforcement suppliers that have participated in the VESPA program, or they may select a user-defined reinforcement. The Supplier's drop-down menu will show all reinforcement suppliers that have input connection testing results with the block that has been selected. Note that the selected block is shown at the top of the reinforcement screen. Some blocks have had extensive connection testing performed with a multitude of geogrids, and others only a few. Therefore, the available geogrids listed in the supplier's drop-down menu will change depending on the block that has been chosen. We believe this will be an enormous advantage to the designer, who in the past has had to sift through the somewhat fragmented availability of test results from many different block companies. The VESPA system manages this information and organizes it automatically for the designer. To input a new user-defined geogrid, we go back to the Settings menu and select Reinforcements. Our sample block has connection testing with at least one geogrid from each supplier. We will choose a grid from Grid Supplier B. We then select a geosynthetic in the available products table on the left and move it into the used in this wall table on the right using the right arrow. Note that you can have unlimited different geosynthetics available in your design from any supplier. Typically, a designer will only need one or possibly two geogrids in a given wall, but the flexibility exists to do more. The geogrid properties are shown. These have been provided by the geosynthetic supplier. We now have to select the types of soils that will be used in the reinforcement zone from the drop-down menu in Geosynthetic Properties. In this example, we will be using well-graded sandy gravels. The selection of this soil type determines the installation damage factor, or RFID, the coefficient of direct sliding, or CDs, and the coefficient of interaction, or CI. Below this, the block grid connection properties are provided for the selected block and grid. These have been provided by the block supplier. Again, these values cannot be edited on this screen or in the connection properties maintenance screen. Beneath the connection properties in the shear with reinforcement data, this is the block-to-block -block shear with the inclusion of a reinforcement layer. These values have been provided by the block supplier. We will now move to the fourth tab, Site Conditions. In the Site Conditions tab, we will define the soil conditions used in the design of the wall. Some default soil types and values have been provided for the reinforced, retained, leveling pad, and foundation zones of the wall. Different soil types and values can be selected from the drop-down menus. The soil parameters listed for each soil are coded according to the Unified Soil Classification System and include typical friction and unit weight values that can be used for preliminary analysis. All of these soil parameters are editable in the Site Conditions tab. If you are consistently using a certain combination of soil types and parameters, you can easily set your defaults to whatever values you wish in the Soils Maintenance screen under the Settings menu. To illustrate this, we will go to the Settings menu and select Soils. The Soils Maintenance dialog box pops up. Here you can change the parameters of the existing soil types or add new soil types. Finally, the Set Soil Defaults button allows you to do just this for each of the soil zones. By hitting Save, we save all changes to either the soil types, parameters, and or defaults. We will now close the Soil Maintenance screen and return to the Site Conditions tab. Keep in mind that any parameters set in the Settings menu are global parameters and will be available for any future project. Within each individual project, any edits or changes made are local to that project and will be saved as part of that project. Below the Soil Parameters area, we have included a feature to include various different drainage layers in the wall. It is important to note that all analysis assumes the walls in fully drained and no hydrostatic pressure is present. The drainage dialog just allows the designer to include a different drainage material for quantity calculation and illustration purposes only. For example, if my reinforced zone is not free draining, I would want to include drainage zones at different locations within the reinforced zone, depending on the anticipated groundwater levels and or surface drainage. 
By selecting Include Drainage, the drainage fields becomes editable. Values are listed for friction angle and unit weight for the drainage material. However, they are not used in the calculation. Three different types of drainage layers are available, which include a face drain, blanket drain for reinforced walls only, and chimney drain also for reinforced walls only. The face drain is immediately behind the wall units and is mainly used for ensuring compaction immediately behind the blocks. We can now set the thickness or front to back depth of the drain. A minimum of 300 millimeters or 12 inches is recommended by the NCMA. We can also set the depth of the impervious cap at the top of the face drain. The top of the wall should always be capped off to avoid water from infiltrating into the face drain from above. A swale should be used to carry surface water away in accordance to recommendations provided in the NCMA design manual. You can set the thickness or depth of the impervious cap here. At the bottom of the face drain, we can indicate that we want the face drain to terminate at either grade, which would mean you would be outletting through the face of the wall, or at base, which would mean you are outletting to a positive outlet, such as a catch basin with an invert below the base of wall elevation. The NCMA recommends that if the high groundwater level is anticipated to be within two-thirds of the height of the wall to the bottom, a blanket drain should be included. This is a drain that runs along the bottom of the reinforced zone to collect water coming from below. Again, a thickness can be set. Finally, if groundwater is anticipated up to a certain elevation above the base of the wall, a chimney drain should also be included to capture water flow from behind. In many cases, the anticipated maximum groundwater elevation is provided by the geotechnical engineer as a given elevation. For example, maximum groundwater level to be elevation 150.5 feet or 150.5 feet above sea level. As the wall grades may rise above or below this at various points, we felt it would be beneficial to be able to set the top elevation of the chimney drain to a certain elevation and let VESPA figure out how high the chimney drain extends in any given panel. We will see this demonstrated later when we look at the cross sections. But essentially, depending on the founding elevation of a given panel, one panel may have 5 feet of chimney drain and another could have 10 feet. We will set our top chimney drain elevation, making it 1 foot above the high groundwater level. The various drainage layers will be shown graphically and in the CAD output and will be included in the quantity calculations. We will now move on to the Extreme Events tab. Included in the Extreme Events tab is seismic loading. VESPA also gives the user the option of including barrier impact loading, which is another extreme event. However, this option is found in the Loading tab, as the user may want to just apply the barrier loading to specific panels and not globally to the entire wall. The barrier impact loading is only applicable to AASHTO analysis and will be dealt with in the AASHTO VESPA tutorial. By selecting Include Seismic Analysis, VESPA automatically runs both seismic and static analysis simultaneously, and the results for both are displayed. We will input the Peak Ground Acceleration Value, or PGA. Next, the user can decide to allow the deflection criteria in the seismic analysis and set the allowable wall deflection to either the default of 3 inches or set their own. Below this, the user has two remaining options for the seismic analysis. These options are only applicable to AASHTO analysis, but we will discuss them briefly. First, the user can choose the option of either including or ignoring face batter in the calculation of the weight of the internal wedge for seismic internal stability analysis. If it is on, the calculation of WA will account for the fact that the wall batter reduces the total area of the wedge and therefore reduces the weight, thereby lowering the applied loads in the geogrids for internal stability calculations. If it is left on, the user is being more conservative, and the wedge is assumed to have a vertical face and therefore will be a larger area and weight. Finally, the user is given the option of including live loads in the seismic analysis in case some specific circumstances warrant this. Now that we have set all of our system design parameters, we can look at the actual wall that we're going to design. 
We will move on to the Stations tab to define the wall layout geometry in the next tutorial. Tutorial number 4.